Hi, this is Randall Schwartz, host of Floss Weekly. This week, Gareth Greenaway joins me. We're going to be talking about Augur, which is a way to use Bitcoin technology to accurately predict the future. You're not going to want to miss this, so stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Floss Weekly is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E. FLY dot com. This is Floss Weekly with Randall Schwartz and Gareth Greenaway. Episode 342 recorded June 24th, 2015. Augur. This episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Casper, an online retailer of premium mattresses for a fraction of the price, because everyone deserves a great night's sleep. Get $50 off any mattress purchased by visiting casper.com slash floss and enter the promo code FLOSS. And by DigitalOcean, simple and fast cloud hosting built for developers. Deploy an SSD cloud server in 55 seconds. Try it today for free. Visit DigitalOcean.com, and once you sign up, be sure to enter the promo code FLOSS in the billing section for a $10 credit. It's time for Floss Weekly, the show about free Libre open source software. I am your host, Randall Schwartz, Merlin at StoneEngine.com, bringing you each week the movers, the shakers, the big projects, the little projects, projects you may be using every day and not aware of it, projects you may want to be involving yourself with right as soon as we finish with this show. This week, not an exception to that, but uh, first let me bring on my co-host, Gareth Greenaway. Welcome back to the show. Thanks, Randall. Thanks for having me. Glad to be back. And, and where are you speaking to us from? I am deep in my underground bunker in Thousand Oaks, California. Awesome, awesome. And I'm speaking probably for the last time from our headquarters in ZipRecruiter, the big green tree for people watching the video, probably recognize that. Last time, though, I'm going to be gone from here for a couple of months, and I'm probably going to start taping from their other headquarters about six blocks away. So that'll be it for that. This week, very interesting project, Augur. Augur.net is their URL. Augur is, what did I say they were? They're, they're a prediction market, uh, and they're a way to manage predictions about things, uh, very, very important to do that. Uh, so like say predicting who's going to win the election, when are we going to get flying cars, uh, that sort of thing. But they're doing it using the Bitcoin blockchain protocol. And it's solving a couple of problems about what we've been doing previously for predictions. I mean, you're probably aware of things like uh, Arbitron and things like that, where people go out and figure out what's the most important TV show or whatever. Uh, well, there's two things uh, that, 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 that this pro this uh, Augur is solving, as far as I can tell from looking at the literature. Uh, one is having accurate predictions because people are betting real money on it. So people will tend to, because of the wisdom of the crowds, bet real money on things that they believe to be more likely than others, right? But then you have the second problem is how do you verify that that actually came true? Well, they're using the blockchain protocol also to handle that side of it, where people are actually then saying, yes, uh, Hillary Clinton did win the election, and people who said that is accurate are going to make more money as well. So uh, very fascinating stuff. Uh, what have you seen so far on this uh, there, uh, um, uh, Gareth? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so, uh, not much more than what, what you've described there. Um, I, I think like the accurate description I, I saw on their site or actually in their video um, was that they're, they're trying to build a basically a Google search engine for the future um, so that yeah. people can go and search for what's going to happen in the future, which sounds really interesting. Yeah, yeah. So in a few moments, we're going to actually bring on uh, the head of the project, Dr. Jack Peterson. But I understand there's a very important message first that uh, my friend Leo Laporte wants to give us. Uh, Randall, if I might interrupt, we'll be back with more Floss Weekly in just a moment. But I want to talk to you about my mattress. Don't wait. Oops. <laughs> Don't go to sleep. Actually, you might sleep even better on a great mattress from Casper. Casper is kind of a cool idea. It's an online, yes, online retailer of premium mattresses for a fraction of the cost. Now, how can you do it online? Well, I think, frankly, you can do it better online. Let me explain. Normally, when you buy a mattress, what do you do? You go down to the mattress showroom, broad daylight, you got your shoes on, your honey by your side, you both lie there staring at the ceiling and kind of embarrassed while a sales girl looks down her nose at you. And in five minutes or less, you're supposed to say, yeah, that's the right mattress I'll be sleeping on for the next 10 years. No, you need more than that. That's not enough. That's why Casper gives you 100 days. That's right. When you go to casper.com slash floss, take a look at the mattress. Beautiful. They start at $500 for a twin 
all the way up to $950 for the king size. They come in this great box, so it's very easy to get. In fact, we end up getting a Casper not only for ourselves, but for my son. He's in college, lives on the third floor, no elevator, and hard to get a mattress up there. He needed a new mattress, so we got him a Casper, and it was easy. He brought the box. I even got a queen. Brought the box up by himself. Opened the box. Boom, there's the mattress. Very comfortable. Obsessively engineered is the phrase that leaps to mind. Uh, two technologies, both latex and memory foam. So the memory foam's the base and the latex on the top, and it gives you both a springiness and sink, but a firmness. I, I cannot sleep on a mattress that's too soft, and yet Lisa doesn't want a mattress that's too firm. This We love our Casper. It's exactly right. Buy it online, completely risk-free. You could try it out for 100 days. You can send it back if you don't like it at no cost to you. I, I think you're going to love it. Save an additional $50 because you're listening to Floss Weekly. All you have to do is use the promo code FLOSS. Casper.com slash FLOSS. And enter the promo code FLOSS to save. Look, even geeks got to sleep. Casper.com slash FLOSS. Use the offer code FLOSS to save 50 bucks. Now back to Floss Weekly. Hey, thanks, Leo, for that very important announcement. Let's go ahead and bring on our guests then. Let's uh, bring on uh, Jack Peterson. Jack Peterson, welcome to the show. Thanks. I appreciate you guys having me on. And where are you speaking to us from? Uh, I'm in Oregon right now. Really? What part of Oregon? Um, it, about an hour south of Portland, uh, a town called Albany. Oh, I know Albany, of course. I'm 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 a Portlander, so of course I know Albany. I've been oh, there many okay. times. So right yeah, on, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, absolutely cool. And let's also bring on Joey. Joey Krug, welcome to the show. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Cool, cool. And where are you speaking to us from? Uh, San Francisco. Okay, good. So you sure since I'm in Santa Monica, so it's sort of like we just have the whole West Coast represented here, which is really nice. Thousand Oaks, uh, San Francisco, and uh, Albany. So very cool, very cool. Well, uh, Jack, I, I gave what I think was my impression of seeing the materials about Augur, but why don't you give, sort of give us the 30,000 foot view and what problem Augur is trying to solve? Sure. Um, so Augur is um, it's, it's, a, it's a prediction market platform, um, and it's it's decentralized in the same way that uh, Bitcoin is decentralized. Um, so uh, there, there's a lot of different ways that things can be uh, decentralized. Um, Bitcoin is it's decentralized to make it very resilient. Mm -hmm. So it's the, uh, this idea where everybody has uh, a full copy of everything that happens on Bitcoin. And so it's a very, it's a, it's a very resilient network. Um, and uh, if you uh, say knock out one node on the Bitcoin network, um, the rest of the network can still thrive. Um, but uh, now, now Bitcoin is uh, it's a it's a very cool technology, but it's designed just to um, send these you know to send Bitcoins between users. All you're doing is sending payments. Um, and what we're doing is we're building software that operates on the same principle where everybody has a copy of everything and it's this very robust, very resilient network. Mm -hmm. um, but we're including all of the machinery that you need to um, make uh, markets, to make prediction markets. And what these are, are um, they're markets where you can bet on whether or not things will happen. So, and these can really be any kind of event. So, um, one of the use cases that people like to use prediction markets for is um, political events. So, for example, you can uh, bet on whether or not Hillary Clinton will be elected uh, in 2016. Um, but uh, this the, this extends to any kind of event. So, so you know, a, pr a prediction market is, uh, you know, it's a, it's a very it's a very general idea. So. You know, another example might be, well, who's going to win the Georgia-Florida game? Um, you know, who's going to win the Super Bowl? Uh, you know, well, how much rain will there be next year? Um, so, um, and then the cool thing about this is that uh, the, uh, the the price of uh, the, the the price of, of, of a share in a, in a prediction market it tells you how likely the event is to happen. So um, if the event ends up happening, like, uh, so say we're betting whether or not Hillary Clinton wins the election. Um, if Hillary Clinton ends up being elected, then the market uh, closes at $1 per share. And if she loses the election, then it's $0 per share. And um, 
the it, it if the event hasn't happened yet, if the election hasn't happened yet, then uh, the amount that you pay per share is the uh, is the probability that the event happened. So, if for example, it's um, if it's uh, forty two cents per share, then that means that there's a forty two percent chance that she would win the election. Uh, sort of the crowdsourced aggregate best estimate. And, and so why why does a prediction market work better like this with actual dollars involved than just simply taking numerous polls, which is clearly what most people do these these days? No, that's a good question. So um, prediction markets work well because – so I don't know if you're familiar with the, the idea of the, the wisdom of the crowd. Um, mm -hmm. And what, what this is is uh, the idea that if, if you ask a, a large number of people uh, a question – and they have some incentive to try and answer correctly. It could be a cash prize. Um, it could be placing a bet. Uh, and then you have some way of of aggregating those estimates. Uh, the it, as long as they're all answering independently and they're trying to do a good job, uh, they're they people tend to make errors in sort of random directions. Like uh, you, you can imagine, maybe you're trying to guess uh, you know what the temperature will be tomorrow. Um, Everybody, you ask 100 people. Well, they're not all going to get it right on, but they tend to over and undershoot it by about the same amount. Um, hmm. And so in the aggregate, uh, the, um, the, the estimate, the average estimate ends up being uh, very accurate, uh, sort of uncannily accurate uh, in some cases. Um, and, and so why does adding a financial incentive make this better? Oh well, it, it's it's so that people really care about it, um, because if you're you know you can imagine if you're asking, um, you know if you're if you're just polling people about um, you know who do you who do you think is going to win the election, um, there's you know there's not really an incentive to go and like do do research and you know build maybe build a statistical model, make sure you're doing a really good job, um, and in fact it, there can be an incentive to do sort of the opposite thing, which is just well. You know, I'm say, uh, well, I'm a Democrat, and I just want to show for my guy, or show, mm -hmm. show for my girl in this case. Um, and uh, that's I, I, and and I, th I think a lot of people uh, actually do that, and um, that and, and they have a, a, a they, they tend not to do that nearly as much when they have money at stake. So you you might think, well, okay, I'm I'm gonna. You know, I'm just going to say, well, you know, I think Hillary will win, you know, just because just because I like her. But um, that's, you know, I, I would be a lot less inclined to do that if I had, say, $10,000 $10, at stake, if I didn't really think she was going to win. Oh, so this is, this is the difference between asking 100 of your friends who's going to win versus asking 100 of your friends that are willing to put up their actual real money at stake, what's, who's going to win. That's right. It, it just it, it, it's you have to kind of put your money where your mouth is, and um, yeah. And what what size of yeah what what size of money are we actually talking about here? Is it a dollar? Is it a hundred dollars each? Or like what what are people going to have to pay to be invested in this? Well, they can um, people can bet as much or as little as they want, um, and um, you know, so it's really just a question of sort of well, how sure are you of your prediction? You know, I mean, um, I, I actually don't follow politics that closely. I really have no idea if Hillary is going to win. And, you know, if someone asks me, you know, what would you put $5, five dollars down on it? I mean, maybe, yeah, what the heck. But, like, well, you know, $1,000, I don't know. That That's, like, I would want to go do some research, you know, and see, like, well, you know, do people really like Hillary Clinton? I don't know. Joey, what's your role with the uh, project? Uh, so I do I do basically core development at the project. I work on the, the back-end code, so... Uh, we use this platform called Ethereum to do things, and I write the code for, for that. And tell me more about what Ethereum is. Uh, so what, what Ethereum is, is it's this platform uh, where you can basically write uh, code using like simple programming languages, and it's compiled to this, this thing called the Ethereum virtual machine. And you can basically run code in a sort of distributed manner, um, and you can basically be practically guaranteed of the outcome of, of, of whatever code you give it. Uh, so it's kind of like Bitcoin in the sense that you, you know um, 
that your money is going to be safe, you know, provided someone doesn't attack the network with a bunch of, you know, capital or mining power. Uh, it's, it's like that, but for running code. And so what's the relationship between that and Augur then? Uh, so we, we basically run our code on, on uh, Ethereum, or at least most of it. And what are you writing, what language are you writing in? Uh, so it's called uh, Serpent, and it's, it's pretty much it's like a, a neutered form of Python. Um, okay, I thought Python already was that, but okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's my Perl bias is showing again. Uh, um, so how long have you been with the project? Uh, since August. Yeah. And um, so maybe describe a, a bit more, uh, you know, I was, I was getting to the point where I was asking Jack th things like, well, so what, what's the size of a typical betting pool then for something like Hillary versus whoever? Um, is it like there's a thousand dollars total at stake and people can bet and get parts of that? Or is it, is the size of the pool unlimited based on how many people are playing? Yeah. So it's, it's unlimited based on how many people are playing. So there's, so basically, like the w the way we do things with with you know the pool is there's a few ways to do it. One is you just have a traditional betting pool and you take pari mutual wagers, but we don't do that because it it doesn't provide uh, as accurate information. And then another way is you have a traditional limit order book uh, like they do on on stock exchanges, um, and that also doesn't work very well for prediction markets. Don't have a lot of volume. So there's there's a final way to do things, which call is called a using an automated market maker. And essentially what you can do is you have an equation and everyone buys and sells from this equation. And um, as people basically come on and buy or sell, they either add or subtract to this pool of liquidity. And so the, the cool thing about a market maker is though, it, it technically uh, has like infinite order depth. So you can basically keep buying as long as you want. Now, of course, you know, once you buy for a while, uh, you're going to push the price up to like 99 cents a share, um, and the most you can win is one per share. Uh, but it's it's still an interesting theoretical aspect. So so if, if initially it's 50 cents, and, and I buy a few shares, it might move to 51 cents just because I bought a few, right? Right. Okay. <clears throat> and then theoretically, people buying on both sides are going to get, you know, it's going to push the price up and down, and that's actually what's going to be ultimately what's predicting the predictive side of what Augur's about. How does the verification side work after the after the election happens? Now what happens? Uh, so after that happens, um, basically there there are a few ways you know we could have approached this. One was you just you know have a few people basically confirm results, and they're like a oracle solution where there's just like ten people reporting on this. Uh, we didn't go with that though because it. It's basically has like really perverse incentives. If you have a small amount of people, um, there's a huge incentive for them to lie or take bribes to essentially, you know, mess with the outcome. Uh, so what we're doing instead is basically having a distributed oracle system um, where it's any of the nodes in the network who want to uh, can basically report on the outcome of events. And so when I say report, basically what happens is. Um, Every once in a while, there'll be like a list of all the events that happened. Um, there are possible outcomes, whether it's yes, no, um, or whether it's you know something that's like a number as an outcome. And as a reporter, you basically report, you know, did this happen? Did this not happen? Uh, for all these events, and then you submit your report. And uh, the way consensus is done on that to actually determine the real outcome is so each report is basically weighted. Um, by something we call reputation, so you can't, you know, civil attack the system, and then, um, and then we we basically figure out how much did each person add to the variance of the system, um, and you know, building on the idea that uh, lies are more variable than truth, uh, you can essentially figure out with really high accuracy which people were, you know, reporting the wrong outcome and which people were reporting the correct one, um, just by looking at who added what what amount of variance to the system. And then after that, we penalize people according to how much variance they added. So if you added a lot of variance, uh, you're, you're probably a liar, so you'll get less reputation. If you added very little, uh, you'll get more. Is uh, reputation uh, monetary, or is it just points in the system somewhere? Um, so it's, it's monetary because, so to incentivize those people, uh, what we do is we basically say, um, 
So there's going to be trading fees in the system, and those fees are set by whoever creates markets. Uh, and since anybody can create a market, um, the fees you know, will vary. Some people will have low fees, some will have high fees. And half the fees go to these reporters. Um, so their, their reputation would be valued at you know, what amount of future fees do we think we can get from the system. Ah, okay. So, so I could, you know, if I'm not really somebody who's smart and wants to bet on Hillary versus whoever, I could still participate in the system by being somebody who says, yeah, Hillary definitely won and make some money that way? Yeah, exactly. Well, that seems like an interesting way to participate as well. And am I paid in Bitcoin? <laughs> I'm trying to figure out how this comes out. <laughs> yeah, so, um, so right now you, you're paid in like uh, this... I mean, right now it's just play money because we're just testing things, right? But um, eventually it'll be Bitcoin. Um, I anticipate, so for it to be Bitcoin, though, there has, there has to be this. There's this technology called um, side chains. And basically what it allows you to do is use Bitcoin on, other, uh, on different blockchains. And it's, it's not really out yet. Um, so bef before people will be able to use Bitcoin, we'll probably um, you know, mainly limit things to, to like a sort of stable cryptocurrency. And... Um, there's a bunch of these in the works, but they're just, you know, cryptocurrencies that aren't made to be deflationary like Bitcoin. So they, they stay pretty stable with respect to the dollar. And that's that's okay. also a lot better for like mainstream users because they don't want to have the volatility of Bitcoin. Okay. So I, by other currencies, you're talking about like Dogecoin or that's just another Bitcoin with another name, right? Um, yeah, not like Dogecoin. Um, there's, um, there's a few of these out there. They're not very popular right now because... Uh, no one really has anything to do with them yet. Um, there's one called Tether. There's one called Nubits. And if, if you just Google them, you'll see that their prices are pretty much consistently either you know a dollar per coin or ninety nine cents a coin, or maybe hmm. a dollar and a penny or something. Okay. Um, we actually had a question from the chat room here. Uh, how is does this betting get affected by gambling laws? And is Augur actually legal to use in the U.S. For example, uh, can you answer that? Yeah, so the answer, like like most legal things, is it depends. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so there's the the way you know we're affected by those laws is um, you know we're we're kind of taking a standoff approach um, similar to like you know BitTorrent did, which is we're not making any markets ourselves, we're not betting on any of them, and that way we don't have to like deal with that uh, directly. Um, as for people who are you know like you know an average American wanting to make markets. Um, you know, but basically, it's some things are legal, some things aren't, and it's it's really variable. Uh, U.S. gambling laws is um, really weird. Some things that you think would be illegal aren't, uh, like fantasy sports betting, um, because they're under the pretense of well, that's skill based. But how that's any more skill based than betting on regular football game? I don't really know. It doesn't really make sense to me. But uh, that's just the way they are. So if someone wanted to kind of like get started with Augur today, is that possible? Like, is it, how, how would they go about kind of getting involved and using it? Yeah, so, um, so right now we're basically testing things. Uh, so it's just, you know, play money, play reputation. Um, if you wanted to get involved, you go to our website, augur.net, and there's basically, there's, you can sign up to our Slack, you know, to talk with us, and you can also get our alpha. Um, and our alpha, there's basically two ways to use it. Um, one is just a website, which is demo.augur.net. And that's pretty much just like a, a demo version. It's connected to one of our um, one of our Ethereum nodes in the cloud, and it's just like shared money. Uh, but if you want to run your own client, um, you basically download Ethereum, and you can just get binaries for that now. And then uh, you would install our client. And there's two ways to get our client. One is... Uh, you can just go to a website and fetch the JavaScript because the UI is a JavaScript UI. Um, or if you don't trust that, you can actually download the source and um, install with Node. So one of the things you just said was um, kind of like it, right now you're in you're in alpha mode, you're in you're in demo mode, um, and it, you're using play money and play reputation. Does does Augur have a concept of like so if I make a prediction or I try and like start a market and say I'm I'm right in, in how the, the market is going to go. Does that, is, is there like a concept of reputation that other people can look at and see like, okay, yeah, that person is right on predictions 75% of the time and, and wrong 25% of the time? 
Yeah, so um, right right now what we plan to do for that is we plan to have, you know, sort of leaderboards. Uh, we've we've implemented like a, a base part of that, which is basically like something in our database that, that records, you know, did you win in this market? How much did you win? What side did you take? And then it's just a matter of um, connecting that up to sort of global leaderboard system and, and then people will be able to see, you know, how accurate others were betting and you know, is this person actually an expert like they claim they are or or not? Is it possible for it to be anonymous or is it does or or would people be using like pseudonyms like like Bitcoin or, or does it have to be like your real identity? Um so it's pseudonyms like Bitcoin. Okay. Um, so, question for Jack: um, How did this whole theory like come about? What what gave you guys the idea to to kind of do this and to use Bitcoin as the the basis for it? So, uh, Augur is actually uh, it came about. It's 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 based on uh, an idea called Truthcoin, uh, which was uh, a, a statistician at Yale came up with this idea. It was a, it was just basically an academic paper. Um, and uh, yeah, jo- Joey and I and um, some of the other people we were working with at the time uh, sort of stumbled across this paper, and um, we just got really excited about it um, uh, because we, th- we uh, I- I've actually been uh, sort of an, an avid prediction market fan for uh, several years, and um, you know I think they're a powerful tool, and I think it's kind of a shame that they're not. Uh, you know they're not they're not as available as they could be, because um, I think that you know they're a, a very potent tool for tapping into the wisdom of the crowd, and um, I think it's basically a bad thing that there's not a publicly available tool to do that right now. Um, and so we got really excited about uh, the, the idea of making a decentralized um, uh, prediction market platform, and um, our, our implementation has uh, it. It differs in some respects from the uh, sort of original Truthcoin idea, um, but the you know the the, the core idea that you know it, it's a decentralized blockchain-based prediction market. Um, that part's the same. Has anyone else attempted to to do kind of what you guys are doing before? Um, we are the first. Uh, we're the the first. At least, as far as I know, we're the first usable software uh, that is uh, implementing this idea. Um, so, yeah, our alpha test is uh, um, the only game in town right now. I think, um, although, I, I, as I understand it, there are uh, other groups working on implementing similar ideas. Okay. Um, so, once once things like are up and running with Augur, um, is will it? What will it cost someone to make a prediction? Um, is it, will there be like fees behind that, or will it be just kind of uh, a free for all? Um, it's more or less a free for all. Um, so there there are fees, but the way they work is they're actually user set. So um, if you uh, so if you if you're the person creating uh, a market on our platform, you specify what you want uh, the trading fee to be. It can be anything; it can be zero if you want. Um, but you, the person who create the market, you get half of the fees that pass through your market um, because in order to kick off trading to begin with, you supply a certain amount of initial liquidity to the market. Um, so uh, it's, it's sort of like you're an entrepreneur. Um, you know, if a lot of people pass through your market, you can make money. Um, so, there are, so there are some fees. Uh, but they're, they're not they're not set by us and they don't they don't go to us they're uh, they're set by and they go and they go to um, the people that create the markets and the people that vote to resolve events so if the if, if the, the people that are using it like the, the your users are the ones where the fees go um, I, I would imagine you guys are, are at some point looking to make money from this what is your what is your your goal there well, so we're actually a uh, we're a nonprofit foundation, um, and uh, you know, so we're uh, we we uh, write open source software. I've written open source software for years. It's something I feel pretty strongly about, um, and uh, the uh, that that said, there is the potential to make money off of this, um, and it's 
so uh, there, there's basically two ways of doing that. One is uh, the sort of the, basically the way that uh, early holders of Bitcoin ended up doing quite well uh, because the Bitcoins themselves became more valuable over time. I think of them as a, being a very sort of literal uh, representation of the value created by the software. Right. And, you know, it's a network, so it's more valuable the more people using it. Um, and uh, so and, and uh, there will be an effect like that uh, with our system as well. Um, and so you get that kind of effect is almost invariable if, if you uh, uh, when you're making decentralized software. And the, and the other is just um, the, uh, the 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 uh, the trading fees. So I said half of the trading fees go to the person that creates the market. Um, and the other half goes to um, the people that uh, report on event outcomes after they happen. Right? So there, there's this basic problem where uh, you know, the, uh, the blockchain doesn't know anything about the world. Right? It has, we want, or the basic goal of this project, you can think of it as getting information about the world into the blockchain. And um, we do that in sort of the simplest possible way, which is we just ask people, like, "Hey, what happened?" Um, and we have, and we have this uh, system of incentives to make sure that uh, it's always the easiest and most profitable uh, option for them to just tell the truth. Um, and um, and in consideration for the time that people that uh, people who are filling out these reports spend doing so, uh, they get the other half of the trading fees. Um, and, um, you know, in initially the, these, it, it will be a very, uh, you know, small amount of, um, of, of trading volume, but as trading volume ramps up, um, it could become more substantial. Um, so it's like, you know, well, uh, and, and, and we hold some of the, uh, so some of the, the tokens that are used to resolve events. Um, basically to pay for ongoing development costs. Um, so if the software does well, we could do well. That's all really awesome. And uh, But speaking of making money, we have to pay some bills here at Twit, so let me just interrupt for a moment and talk to you about DigitalOcean. Whether you're an experienced programmer or just getting started, you need flexible, reliable, and affordable hosting. DigitalOcean provides developers with droplets, which are virtual private servers that can be customized and quickly deployed to host websites, web apps, production applications, personal projects, virtual desktops, and almost anything else you can think of with full root access. I myself as a DigitalOcean uh, subscriber already. I have a little uh, $5 a month server that I build all my FreeBSD packages on. It's been awesome. Uh, I found out about it at scale a couple months ago, and uh, it's been really useful for me so far. It's built for developers and used by over 400,000 of them, including me. You can deploy and configure via a streamlined control panel or simple API. You can choose your OS. That's what I really like about this. Ubuntu, CentOS, Debian, Fedora, CoreOS, and FreeBSD. That's my choice, of course. And one-click install allows you to quickly deploy apps like Docker, LAMP, MediaWiki, WordPress, Magento, Ruby on Rails, and many more. It's an amazing project. You definitely check it out. So easy to get started. You can deploy an SSD cloud server in as little as 55 seconds. I have verified that. I typed my information in. 55 seconds later, I was up and actually SSHing in my own box. It was great. DigitalOcean has incredibly affordable and straightforward pricing. Servers start at only $5 a month. There's also hourly pricing available starting at less than a penny per hour. But we're going to make it so you can get started today and deploy an SSD cloud server for free. Visit DigitalOcean.com and create an account. Once you confirm your email and account information, go to the billing section into the promo code FLOSS, F-L-O-S-S, for a free $10 credit. That's enough to run a machine for two full months for free. That's plenty to get started and explore what DigitalOcean can do. That's digitalocean.com. And once you sign up, enter the code F-L-O-S-S in the billing section for a $10 credit. And we thank DigitalOcean for their support of FLOSS Weekly. And so uh, back to our guests, just a second, uh, and uh, Dr. Jack, um, so, so what do you see the size of these pools ending up being? I mean, are, are we talking about thousands and thousands of dollars being bet on Hillary, or is it tens of dollars? I mean, what's your vision for this? You must have some sense of this. Well, it really depends. Uh, you know, it, it's entirely determined by the users. I mean, how much money people want to bet on it and how much they're comfortable betting on it. I mean, my, my, my prediction, for what it's worth, is that uh, – Initially, the amount of money passing through the system, uh, it, through any part of the system, will be very small, um, just because you know the, there's uh, you know there's going to be an initial period where people are still getting used to it, 
um, you know, people are, and also still getting used to the idea that hey, the system's trustworthy. It's okay to put my money in there. Um, and uh, but I, I think that um, you know the the amount of money involved will will grow over time um, as the system sees wider use. And then have you used Augur yet to ask how much money you're going to make from Augur? No, but maybe we should. <laughs> <laughs> See, it seems like a seems like a relevant and important question, I guess. Yeah, it'd be Augurception, I guess, right? <laughs> um, so what's what's been the process of pulling the people together that are doing this sort of thing? Is this is this? Um, I, I, you said you've worked with uh, you've worked with Joey before, but how, how are you? identifying people to help you with this and what are, the, what are their various roles? Well, uh, really it's more like they're finding us. Um, I, it's, it, this is an open source project. So, uh, you know, we sort of welcome all comers, uh, anybody who wants to hack on the code can do so. Um, and, uh, yeah, you know, there's, there's always more code to write. Um, the, the sort of core team, um, they were, uh, yeah, so we'll sort of I, I, I describe them as a I describe us as sort of a ragtag band of misfits, um, <laughs> cool. and uh, it's a, it mostly it's just you know uh, we uh, sort of we sort of knew each other beforehand, um, or a lot a lot of us did, and um, yeah, uh, we we all you know are really into cryptocurrencies, really into Bitcoin, um, and we think that. Decentralized technology in general is just like this, you know, it's this very powerful idea. There's, you know, I guess this is almost a philosophical point, but the, you know, I think there's an increasing uh, trend towards centralization uh, in a, a lot of aspects of society. Um, and, um, you know, I, th I think it's, and I think it's, a, it's actually like a cultural trend. It's like a social, technological um, cultural trend, and um, and I think because that's true, it's something that's um, it's very hard to it's very hard to stand up to that. Um, and um, I think that decentralized technology, blockchains in particular, uh, represent a sort of rare and precious uh, counter trend. Um, and um, you know, I'm, as a as a developer, I feel like well, it's a I ought to put my shoulder to the wheel. You know, this is, um, you know, it's just because it's sort of, it's this countervailing force, and, you know, give some punch back to the little guy. Would there be any reason at this point for someone else to take all of your work and run something similar but in parallel to it? Would there be any gain for them? Uh, or would it just be uh, sucking up the, the second half of the, uh, the available funds to make this happen? Um, I, I guess it depends what you mean about uh, by, by someone um, taking what we've done. I, I think I mean so everything is open source. So anybody who wants to run the code can do so. Anybody who wants to fork the code can do so. Um, I would say one thing that we've found in building the system over the past year or so is that um, it's in it, it's in a lot of ways more more difficult than we expected. Uh, there, there's a lot mm. of uh, there's a lot of sort of non-obvious challenges, um, which I, I think that's true in building any kind of decentralized system. You know, you, when you think about building an application, I think it's very natural to think about the challenges just in terms of the sort of application logic, like the business logic. Um, but with decentralized applications, there's always this, um, you know, this sort of uh, pervasive extra complications due to the fact that you're handling a lot of the networking yourself, um, mm -hmm. and um, and and in with this project in particular, I think we've uh, at this point amassed a lot of very domain specific expertise, um, and so I think someone could fork our code. So sorry, this is sort of a long winded answer. So someone could fork mm -hmm. our code, but I think that they would find it very hard to edit or maintain or ex or extend the code. Um, just because it's not, uh, it's not, it's not cookie cutter at all. You know, it's not like, well, this is a web app, and I can look up on Stack Overflow how to do things that I don't know. It's, um, you know, it's, uh, it's something that there, there's a lot of ground to cover. Well, is this still likely to be run by many different people, though? I mean, if if all of your team, you know, disappeared tomorrow, 
is there still a way for us to finish the prediction for the election and, and pay people out? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So the, the software is fully decentralized. It doesn't rely – or once it's – um, you know, fully running and fully stable, and uh, there are real money prediction markets on it. Um, it won't rely on us in any capacity, ex except to you know push new features and things like that. Um, and and even that won't really be re relying on us. It, it'll just be easiest for us to do it. Um, but the you know the software will remain usable. I mean, it, it, it's usable to anybody that wants to use it. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. You'll, you'll still be able to uh, bet on the election. You'll still be able to close markets. None of that is done uh, by us, like just by virtue of being us. Um, you know, we're uh, once the system launches, um, you know, we, we would be users like any other. Uh, but we're, we're purpose hey, a lot, much like Bitcoin. We, we're setting this up so that we're not uh, so we don't want to be a single point of failure for the system. You know, and and because it's important to have the the system be very robust. Okay. And, and um, is there yeah, anything? A, yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um, and you know, and because we don't want to don't want to be a single point of failure, uh, we're purposely setting it up so that we could just step back and the system would keep running. It's autonomous. Is, is there any other? You know, Bitcoin has some inherent risks in it but it, most of those are minimized by the fact that everybody can look at the blockchain and see what's going on are there any additional risks that something like the prediction market with auger introduces above and beyond the bitcoin protocol blockchain protocol that's a good question so i mean there are um you know there, we're, all, we're building a lot of functionality beyond what's in Bitcoin. I mean, of course, we have the basic functionality of being able to send tokens from computer to computer. Um, but there's a lot of other stuff. And, you know, when there's other stuff there, it's true that there's, um, you know, every function is something that could potentially go wrong. Um, and, uh, you know, we're, we're, and we're basically we're trying to mitigate that just by uh, testing as much as we can. Um, I think that a lot of the, I, I think that a lot of the, the the hard problems in terms of the networking and the basic plumbing have been, uh, you know, basically figured out at this point, and um, that's actually one uh, one reason why we're opting to use uh, the Ethereum platform as um, sort of the, the the foundational layer for Augur, um, because um, you know we're uh, we're a small team, like I said, we're a nonprofit, and um, it's uh, you know it's it's good to have someone else handle that part of it and test out that part of it. Um, and um, yeah, did I answer your question? Yeah, it's pretty good. Sorry. That's pretty close to that. Yeah. Um, so um, um, we're almost out of time, and I just want to make sure that uh, we've gotten everything out. Um, for those of you that are listening uh, to the uh, taping of the, uh, the taped show, tape, not tape anymore. What am I talking about? <laughs> it's a little short today because we started a little late. Um, but uh, I want to make sure our audience is uh, aware of everything that you want to make sure they're you make sure they're aware of. Huh? I guess that makes sense. Yeah, that's English. Okay. Uh, so uh, first, we'll start with you, Jack. Is there anything else that you want to make sure our audience is uh, aware of? Uh, well, you guys uh, may have covered this um, when I was uh, my internet <laughs> died, but I. Uh, the most important thing, I think, is just that we have uh, an, we have an alpha test out. Um, it was just uh, released a few days ago, and um, you know you can you can use it. It's uh, the, we have a, a web-based version, um, which is uh, you know basically just go. You can just go to it in your browser. It's very very painless, very easy to use. You don't have to download anything, um, and uh, we have the full downloadable version. And um, you know, we're looking and we're looking for alpha testers. You know, we want great. Uh, people to help assess it. Great. And uh, Joey, anything, anything last, uh, last from you? Um, I would just say, uh, pay attention, um, in a couple of months, cause then we're going to have our beta test, which will have, you'll be able to basically, you know, create your own account and, uh, do lots, lots of more things than you can do in the alpha. Um, because the alpha accounts shared account to just play around with uh, about the beta. You'll actually be able to make your own account and, uh, you know, use your own, uh, your own play money, I guess. Uh, so it, sh it should provide some more interesting predictions. Very cool. You, very cool. You, so go ahead. You can. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, go I was ahead. Say, you, you, 
you can uh, create your own account if you use the downloadable version. Um, Joey's specifically talking about the, um, the the web client, which is something we're going to be upgrading over the next month or so. And so what's the timeline for actually being able to, uh, say, you know, pay $100 and get a prediction for Hillary? Is that is that soon? Um, it'll be as, as soon as... Uh, as soon as we're, you know, confident that the, the software is really running smoothly and that, um, you know, there's there's not, you know, again, right now we're we're in an alpha testing mode, so yeah. that means that you know we're we're still expecting to find bugs and you know we're expecting things will crash occasionally. Um, really, it's actually been smoother than expected, um, but, uh, you know, w until we're sure that it's everything's really running completely smoothly and uh you know we uh you know we have thorough tests for everything um we don't want people putting real money into the system yeah you know, yeah we, cool we, uh, well, when it comes to that you know we need to be really careful that makes sense okay i have two other questions i have to ask you or my audience gets mad at me uh so we'll start with uh, dr jack first uh what's your favorite scripting language uh python uh <laughs> Or yes. Julia, okay. if that counts as a scripting language. You know, I don't even know what Julia computer. is. What what is Julia? It's um, uh, it's it's a scientific computing language. Uh, oh, okay. I think of it as kind of like a, it's a mashup of uh, Python and MATLAB, and has a lot of the features I like in both those. Very cool. Very cool. And your favorite text editor? Uh, I use Sublime Text. Um, okay. okay. I use Sublime Not Text too. Too, and I'm. I'm thinking of getting three, but I haven't had. Okay, okay. And Joey, same two questions? Um, so, favorite, probably Python. Um, mm -hmm. And then uh, text editor, yeah, I just use Sublime Text 3. Occasionally, <laughs> occasionally use, um, occasionally use um, Emacs, but not too often. Oh, good. At least, at least a mention of Emacs. That's good. At least I've got a mention in there. That's really great. Well, guys, I wish we could have talked to you for another half hour or so, but we don't have the time. We're out on a hard out here. So uh, thank you, uh, Jack Peterson and Joey Cook, for talking to us about Augur, and hopefully people will check it out for you. Yeah, thanks, thanks so much for having us on. Very cool. That was uh, Jack Peterson and Joey Krug talking to us about Augur. What do you think, Gareth? Uh, it sounds really interesting. Um, I'm, I'm curious to see... Um, Given how how huge Bitcoin has has gone and, and all the different directions that, that people have taken it, I'm I'm curious to see what ends up happening with Augur. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it, it, he says it's the first. This is great. I mean, if we can get to the point where we essentially have, uh, well, as they said in one of their video demos, uh, the, the, a future Google, where you can just type in a question and come back with an answer that, uh, well, it'll be over time, obviously, and paid out over time when the prediction comes true or not. That's kind of crazy that way. So that's good. Um, so yeah, th um, it, this whole this whole you know decentralizing stuff is really really awesome. I just keep seeing more and more about this. So this is uh, this looks like it should be pretty fascinating. So uh, uh, like I said, we're just about out of time. So I need to go through the rest of my end of show stuff real quickly here. So we'll talk about the upcoming guests. We've got Free Switch coming up next week, which is a telephony platform. We're going to be talking with the people of Oscon, Rachel Romilitis, something like that. <laughs> God, I got Hopefully she'll not, forgive me for mispronouncing her name, but she's going to talk to us about what's actually happening at OSCON this year. Digicam is going to be coming on. It's advanced digital photo management. So if you have a lot of photos, this will be a great open source way of taking care of that. OSCON will actually be at OSCON with uh, some surprise guests. We surprise even to us since we don't know who we're going to be interviewing there yet. Uh, Talkie, which is a video chat and screen sharing. Gambus, the free object-oriented basic inspired by Visual Basic. Uh, Ichingo, which is a fork of Nagios, a scalable and extensible monitoring system. Uh, and Dart, we're going to be having the lead of the project, Casper Lund and uh, Anders Sandholm, who is the project leader within Google. Talk to us about Dart. We've got a bunch more guests also on the very short list. If you go to twit.tv slash floss, you can see our homepage for the show. Redesigned, by the way. Boy, the website looks beautiful now. Really, really changed. Really nice stuff. Um, twit.tv slash floss is the homepage. Uh, if you have a project that needs to be on Floss Weekly, please have the project leader email me, Merlin at stonehenge.com. My address is there on the homepage of the show. We have a live stream. We took a couple questions from there. That is, uh, we tape at 8 a.m. Pacific time on uh, live.twit.tv 
on Wednesdays. I keep forgetting to say Wednesday in there. I better write that in here in my notes. Okay, uh, we have uh, Google Plus, Floss Weekly on Google Plus, uh, where I announce all the new guests and uh, with it gets mapped over automatically to Floss Weekly on Twitter if you prefer that. Um, I am going to be a guest on a, another podcast called Decentralized, which is about the very topics we were talking about today. Decentralized.fm. I'm going to be a guest probably about three or four weeks from now and I will be picking that up. Uh, so I'll let you know when I'm on there. Um, I'll be in Fizzlay in July, just three weeks from now, uh, giving a one-hour talk on Dart. I'll be at OSCON also in July. If you see me at any of these events, please come up and say hi. I would really appreciate that. Anything quick for you to plug, Gareth? Um, so I'll, I'll quickly plug Scale. Um, so mm -hmm. Scale is, is happening January 21st to the 24th, 2016 in Pasadena, California. Um, we have our call for papers open. It's open until October, I believe, November. Um, so anyone interested in submitting a talk should submit the talk today or sometime between now and October. Um, <laughs> our registration should be open soon. Um, so once it is, uh, anyone interested in attending can use the code FLOSS for a 50% discount. All right, Gareth. Well, thank you for uh, stepping up at the last minute to be the co-host for this show. I had a bit of discussion in the channel or in our private email about that. But uh, thank you once again, and uh, we'll see you all next week again on Floss Weekly.